Welcome everyone to the September meeting of the Heritage Committee. And I'd like to call the meeting to order and begin with the land acknowledgement. The city of Kawartha Lakes respectfully acknowledges that we are situated on Mississauga lands and the traditional territory covered by the Williams treaties. We are grateful for the opportunity to work here, and we thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. We recognize and deeply appreciate to this point. Also recognize contributions of he and other people being and speaking of the So the first item of business is the adoption of the agenda. We have made a change to the agenda and the presentation from Laura Love on the curatorial services will follow the reports. All those in favor of this agenda. May I have someone move it first and then someone second it? Is there a mover? Anne, thank you. Seconder? Ron, all those in favor? Thank you, the motion is carried. So, <clears throat> have any Declaration of pecuniary interest relating to items on the agenda. There being none, we'll proceed to the minute. Has everyone had a chance to read them? So may I have a mover for the minutes if there are no agenda uh, minutes changes to be made? Is anyone willing to move the minutes then? All right, Sandy, seconded by Ian. All those in favor? Thank you, the motion is carried. So we'll now move on to the curatorial services. Uh, we'll move that aside and go on to the heritage planning update. Emily? Thanks, Ethel. Okay, so there's a few things on the heritage planning update. Uh, some of them are standard stuff and some of them are things about the municipal election. So we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about the regular stuff um, and then I'll run through how things are going to work uh, over the next few months because we are now into our uh, municipal election period. So that's always fun. Um, okay, so council meetings, um, August 23rd. I had a report going to council for that one. Um, it was just kind of an FYI for council. Uh, they had requested a report just talking about how property owners are notified uh, when properties are designated. Um, so that was just an information report that they'd asked for. Uh, so nothing interesting there. Um, September 27th, that's our next council meeting. So there's no committee of the whole for September. Um, there's gonna be three heritage related reports um, at that meeting, which we looked at all the items um, in our uh, August meeting. So that's the designation of 33 North Water Street, um, the objection to the listing of 17081 Simcoe Street and the amendment to the designating by law for 17 Sussex Street. Um, the other thing that's going to that is the designated by law for 761 Salem Road is going, uh, the notice period for that is expired and there were no objections, which we didn't expect. So that's good. Um, the next thing is since council um, directed us to go on to the HCD plan for Old Mill Pumpkin Hollow uh, in July, uh, we've scheduled our first um, public meeting for that, which is going to be in person. So that's quite nice. Um, it's going to be on September 15th at 730 um, at the Armory. Uh, so it's in the North End room, not in the main room. Um, so if you do want to come, uh, then feel free to. So it'll be sort of 730 to nine ish or less. Um, and I'll do a presentation just to kind of give an overview, 
the usual HCDs, how they work, that sort of thing. Uh, we'll have a QA and a and we're also going to do a, a bit of a brainstorming session with people who show up um, on like vision and goals for the HCD and the HCD plan. So it's just kind of a sort of a high level discussion with residents about what they want. Um, and then we're going to um, do a redo of it on Zoom again on September 20th on at, also at 730. Same thing. Um, it's, uh, you have to register for that. So if you wanna to come to that one, it's just for people who aren't able to attend and also so that I can record the meeting. Um, the nice thing about doing them on Zoom is that we can record them and put them up on Jump In so people can watch them later. So that's good, uh, so we'll be doing that. Um, and notices have gone out to owners for that. So they're, they're in the mail. I put them in the mail yesterday. Uh, so I'm sure everyone will call me uh, next week about that. Uh, the next thing is the Old Bethany Post Office. They're gonna be doing a little unveiling ceremony for their designation plaque um, on Sunday, September 11th at 10 a.m. So they're on our doors open, um, uh, our doors open list, which Ian is gonna talk about, <laughs> talk about later. Um, and they decided that they wanna do a little thing to unveil their designation plaque. Um, so they're gonna say something, I'm gonna say something, Bill Bateman is gonna say something um, about that as well, um, it'll, I guess they'll just have a little thing. I, I don't actually know what they're planning, but if you wanna come down for that, it's at 10 on the 11th. Uh, the next thing is the National Trust for Canada is holding its annual conference in Toronto from October 20th to 22nd. Um, so that's sort of the big heritage conference for like the big national heritage conference for the year. Um, that is when it is, um, you're welcome to attend if you want, but you have to pay for it yourself. So. We don't have any funding for uh, committee members to attend that conference, um, but if you do want to attend, then that's fine. Um, the information is online. Um, I will be at that one, so I'll I'll bring back some interesting tidbits for you um, for uh, for our November meeting. Okay, so that's all kind of the usual business stuff, and then the next thing is the municipal election. So, um, as we all know, there's a municipal election taking place in October. Um, and that means that the, this committee is also going to dissolve as well. So I just wanted to give the committee kind of a rundown of how it's going to work. Um, so we're still working out the exact details with, um, with the clerk's office at the moment, just to make sure we have all the timings and everything fits together. because There's a lot of moving pieces. Um, but here's the plan. So the municipal election is between October 14th and 24th, and the new council is going to be inaugurated on November 15th. Um, so what our clerk's office would like is for our new committee to be in place as soon after the 15th of November as possible. So the next council meeting after that is November 22nd, um, which means that right now we're looking to get our committee appointments to the November 22nd council meeting, which means that everything's going to be advertised in the fall. So um, that's for statutory committees. So for other committees, it's a little bit more relaxed, but for the three statutory committees, so that's this one planning committee of adjustment. Um, the plan at the moment is to circulate applications in the newspaper and on the city website in fall of 2022. Um, and everyone has to reapply. So all the positions end at the end of this year. If you'd like to be back on the committee, um, then you're going to have to reapply and interview for your position. That's just how it works. Um, if you do want to reapply um, or thinking about it, let me know. Um, the clerk's office is looking to know kind of numbers for returning committee members, just, just so we kind of have an idea of what we're looking for um, and how much effort it's, <laughs> how much effort it's going to be to, um, to do all of the interviews and everything so we can start thinking about that. Um, so I, I'm not sure when the advertisements are going to be out yet. I will send out more information to everybody on email once we have those. Um, I'll also send out the link to the to the ad and the application form once we have it, um, so you don't have to go looking for it. Um, and I'll just keep everybody on top of that. But we're we're looking to have the new committee in place by the end of November, um, which means that our December meeting, which we'll talk about in our in our next um, report, will be the new committee. So that's, I know that's a lot, and we'll just, um, as it sort of goes forward uh, over the next couple months, I'll just give you guys all updates. If you have any questions about how it works, feel free to send me an email or call me and we can chat about it. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it on the election front. Um, but just so you know, we're probably going to be doing reapplication in sort of October or so, so be prepared if you want to 
reapply for the committee. And if there's any changes to that, I'll let everybody know. Um, the clerk's office is just finalizing exactly what they want to do right now. So that's, <laughs> this is what they told me. Um, and I will give you updates as I get it from them once they are all set. Uh, since they have lots to do over the next couple months as well with getting our, our new council in place. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, does anyone have any questions on any of those things? I am listening. Yes, I got a quick one. Uh, Emily, do you want or would you need uh, perhaps planning staff support at either of those meetings in September? Um, if you'd like to, yes. Um, it would actually be good to have um, some support for the in person one because uh, we're okay. going to do some like stations where people can brainstorm. So having some warm sure. bodies would be helpful. Maybe we can chat sure. about this afterwards. Okay. But yes, That's that would be good. Any other questions? Yeah, Councillor Ashmore? Yeah. Um, yes, to Emily, um, how does it work for, like, hopefully the members that are here, that they'll have a chance to get back on and would they, I don't wanna use preferential, but I mean, they've, you know, they've certainly done a great job and they, I, I, I can't speak for everybody here, but I know that most of the, members here would most likely want to carry on. How does it work? Like who, who does the interviews and like for myself, I don't know, it all depends on the new mayor who, who appoints to it. It'd be nice to go back on, but I, I don't know about myself, but for the members that are here, do they, how does this work? Um, the reapply and who, who decides um, if you know that? <laughs> Yeah, so historically, historically, how it has worked is that the interview team has been at the like, so at the beginning of a term of council, historically, it's been the staff liaison. So myself, and two people from the new council. Um, that might be different this time, because we have such a quick turnaround. So I'll let everybody know, um, we'll get that guidance from the clerk's office. And um, yeah, I'll let you know. So people, I mean, people who applied midterm, it was the count the council rep and the chair uh, but we won't have a chair or a council rep so <laughs> so we'll have to figure out who that's going to be i suspect it'll be two two counselors um that's what's been done in the past uh but this is a very quick turnaround for it um so we're just waiting on some direction for the clerk's office from that um in terms of people who want to be back on the committee we would obviously we, we'd like to have everybody back so that's super um and I mean, not, not necessarily you get preferential treatment, but your experience being on the Heritage Committee already obviously counts in your favor. Okay, that's good. That's good, thanks. Anyone else? Someone move so this information. Oh, hi Daisy. Oh, hold on, sorry. <laughs> Skip, so I have a second. Ian, all those in favor? The motion is carried. The next is meeting schedule revisions and Emily, you're back on. Sorry, Daisy was wandering in there. Okay, um, let me just pull out here, okay. So our meeting schedule. Uh, so this is just uh, related to our election thing that we were chatting about. Um, so we set an we set a uh, a schedule at the beginning of each year. Well, actually, usually in December we set it for the next year. Um, so we set those for 2022. Usually we don't meet in July and December. That's sort of how we normally do things. Um, but because it's an election year, um, we'll need to revise those dates just to accommodate a few different things. Um, namely the fact that we're going to have a new committee in December um, and also the fact that the election is in October. Um, so what I'm suggesting is that October we're not going to meet at all. It's it's awkward to meet in election period um, and also I'm going to be away on that date so um, it's a bit it's a bit problematic. Um, we'll meet again on November 3rd which is our our usual date that we're going to meet and then uh, in December we will have a meeting but instead of on December 1st we'll have it on December 8th just to give a little bit more time there. 
Um, and that will be the new committee. And instead of having kind of our regular meeting where we do all this sort of stuff, um, that will be the inauguration of the new committee and our training session. So for everyone who came on the committee, you did the, the training, like orientation, all that sort of stuff. That's what the, the eighth will be, plus some additional stuff, um, current projects, introduction to whoever our new council member is, uh, either Ron or somebody else, <laughs> somebody else, whoever the mayor decides. Um, so maybe we will reintroduce ourselves to Ron or to somebody else. So we'll we'll figure that out. Um, and then if we do have any new people on the committee, um, then that'll be an opportunity for them to meet everyone else as well. Um, so if we do have any urgent business, um, which would basically be heritage permits or planning applications, uh, we'll just call a meeting on an as needed basis. Uh, if we need to meet in October, we'll uh, we can call a meeting or the, the chair in consultation with the city can call a meeting. Um, so we'll we'll let you know if that's the case, uh, but usually we don't get too much of that kind of stuff in October anyways. Uh, so that is what, um, that's what we're proposing in terms of changing our schedule up. Uh, so you're off the hook for October, basically. I understand it's our last meeting as a committee. No, November will be. November. So November 3rd will be the last meeting is of November 3rd is the last meeting of the committee. This committee. Okay. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Are there any questions? Comments? All right. We have someone move this for acceptance, please. Approval. Bill Peel and Julia Hartman. All those in favor. The motion is carried. Then we have an alteration application for 398 Con County Road 41 in Bexley Township. Emily? Okie dokie. So this is the former Bexley Methodist Church um, and the owner of the property has applied to remove the chimney. So I will like, I'll just show you a picture of the chimney uh, just so you know what we're talking about here. Um, hold on, I'm gonna share my screen. There it is, ta-da. Okay, it's this, okay. It's this building, uh, which is from the back. I'll just see if I can find a better picture. I'm just gonna click through these. Uh, it's this building. It's the old uh, Methodist church in Bexley. Um, it's now a private residence. Um, so the church was closed in the 1960s. Sorry, I'm just flipping back to the picture of the chimney, which is very hard to photograph because the building is surrounded by trees. It's up there. Um, so it was, um, yeah, it was converted to a residence in the 1970s, um, and it was used as a cottage at that time. So they put in this fireplace at the back of the, um, at the back of the church, uh, with this chimney, uh, which apparently is, well, and by apparently, I mean, it's not very well, <laughs> it's not very well constructed. Um, so the chimney is disintegrating at the moment, um, and it's also causing some, the owner believes it's causing some damage on the roof. Uh, so underneath where the chimney is, there's a door uh, which is sticking and the owner is pretty sure that that's because the weight of the chimney uh, is pushing down on the structure and causing it to, uh, to sink in the middle there. So the, what the owner would like to do is to remove the chimney and cap the roof. And that's it. It's fairly straightforward. It's not, it, the chimney is not a heritage feature. It's from the seventies. We'll just stop sharing this now. There we go. Question, how are they going to provide a chimney for that fireplace? The fireplace has been removed. Uh, oh, you're down there now. <laughs> okay, any questions or comments relating to this application? There being none, may I have someone move the approval of the removal of the chimney? Julia and Anne. All those in favor? The motion is carried, thank you. And let's continue with the last report. Um, and then we'll come back to you, Laura, for your presentation. So the last report is Scugog River designation project update and discussion. Emily? Okay, 
Thanks, Ethel. So this is just a report to facilitate some discussion on this particular project. Um, so the committee brought this up back in January of 2021, um, that they wanted to pursue the designation of the Scugog River uh, through in its the section of it through Lindsay. Um, a subcommittee was formed for this, and I don't think anyone has done anything on it. So um, really, this report is to, um, to discuss what the subcommittee is going to do, probably refresh who is on the subcommittee so everybody remember, remembers who you are, um, and then also to chat about next steps if the committee wants to continue to pursue this project. Um, so this, I mean, this is one of the ones uh, that it had, there's quite a bit of work, back end work to do with this one. Um, and we, it's just sort of been sitting in the wings for a little while. Uh, and it might be something good to work on in the fall while we're not doing anything else because of the election. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, before we get into to chatting about it, there's just a few things I wanted to bring up about this. Um, so in order to do this, um, if this is something the committee is still interested in pursuing, there's a few things that are going to have to be done. Uh, one of them is a heritage evaluation report, uh, which is going to require a lot of background research on it. Um, so that will definitely need to be done before um, before anything is pursued. Uh, the next is with regard to jurisdictional issues. Um, so the Scugog River is part of the trans Severn Waterway and there is federal jurisdiction over it. Uh, so the committee is gonna have to work with Parks Canada on it. Um, so you'll have to reach out uh, and discuss it with Parks Canada so that uh, we have some dialogue between agencies on this one. Um, the next thing just to chat about, and this is sort of a, a further on down the road once the background has been done um, and the, the work with Parks Canada has been also done, um, is what the best method of protection is. Uh, so designation under part for the Heritage Act um, may not be the most appropriate method of designating this. Um, you may want to do it another way, uh, but that's something that the committee would, the subcommittee would have to explore how they want to do that. Uh, and then the other thing is just to think about what um, what the actual outcome of this is. So do you want to protect the river for its own right? Do you want to put development guidelines in place? So what are you actually looking for when it comes to this particular um, designation? So obviously you don't have to answer that right now, but just a few things to think about while we're chatting about this particular project. Do you have a list of the members currently on the subcommittee, Emily? No. I don't know who is on the subcommittee. So this was this was a subcommittee that was uh, sort of committee driven so that I wasn't doing any staff support on it. Uh, so I don't know who is on it. <laughs> so my understanding of it was and Jim, is that right? And we also had Julia say that she joined that as well. As far as I, I think John also wanted to be on it too. Okay. Is that correct, John? Yes, that's correct. I wanted to be on it. Good. So as far as I know, that's the subcommittee as it stands. Ian? And in terms of the um, scope of, the, of what the committee wanted to protect, I think part of this grew out of the discussion we had around that proposed development at uh, the corner of Wellington and William Streets, the tower, and sort of how that could impact sight lines and vistas and all this sort of stuff as it pertained to the Scugog River. So not so much the water, but sort of the landscape around the water from the riverbank, maybe up to street level. I think that's kind of the, the scope of what we were going to be looking at, as I recall. I think we were concerned on doing it up into the turning basin there and uh, down through and uh, our new heritage conservation district as well as to where the city developed. And I think part of it was to provide guidelines as to development uh, and distances of designation on both sides of the river. 
so to, I guess, claim it as public lands on both sides. Right, so you can't do that with a part four. You, you have to do that in some other methods with some other kinds of um, mechanism. So that's basically why we have to have the discussion what other forms of designation are available to us. So we may be able to designate the river itself and then provide some other kind of protection for the water's edge. So you probably can't actually designate the river as a part four. No. That would depend on Parks Canada because it is under federal wow. jurisdiction. So you have a bit of an issue there. Um, but that's not, that's a discussion to have with Parks Canada. Yeah. Uh, so really the only, how there's two ways you can approach this. One is to do as an HCD. Uh, the other one is to do it as an official plan amendment, which to include it as a cultural heritage landscape within the culture and heritage policies the official plan, which requires a public meeting and an official plan amendment. So those are, those are kind of your options of how to do it. Um, just to think about that, but in terms of, I mean, before you even get to that point, we actually have to know what the significance of the river is and denote boundaries of where this would go to or how it would work. Um, I mean, if you have an HCD, you have to do an HCD study. That's, I mean, that's the reality of it. Um, if you were to do it as an official plan amendment, um, you could be a little bit more loosey goosey about boundaries, um, but you would have to have some very clear language and background studies in terms of its significance um, in order to justify that. Um, you'd probably have to make major changes to our culture and heritage policies in the OP as well. Those are sort of your options. Well, I experience working with Parks and Heritage Canada on, on previous I found anything X um, and heritage feature, I haven't found them to be too heavily objecting to, but there certainly have been things that we've had to work out together. Yeah, I mean, Parks Canada is generally pretty amenable, but you do have to work with them. That's, yeah. you know, it's, it's not a big deal working with them, but they are there and that it is their, uh, it is their ball game on the river, so. All right, any comments or questions, Anne? I'm trying to get my head around this a little bit more. Um, the river itself is part of the Trent Severn, so it's already a national historic site. So is this a precedent setting thing where you're protecting vistas to the waterway? Like, have we seen that done before anywhere along the Trent where the water's edge is protected to protect the vistas to the water? Not, uh -huh. I don't think it's been done on the Trent Severn, but there it's done in other areas. And there's there other okay. sort of cultural heritage landscape protections that do similar things. Okay, okay. With the I can think of is the, the fish weir the of Ching and Simcoe. Okay, thank yeah. you. Ian? I think to your point, Athol, the specific part of the river that uh, we do choose to focus on will matter because um, you know, there is a risk here of scope creep. Um, really, the entire Scugog River from, Scugog, from Lake Scugog all the way up to Sturgeon Lake does matter. Um, so do we keep it within the, the town limits of Lindsay? Um, do we keep it just to the, um, the downtown part of the river, which would include the turning basin and the locks? Do we keep it to um, portions of the, of the river that were used for industrial purposes? Do we include recreational purposes in that as well? Um, there's a whole slew of factors, I think, that we would have to focus on beneath just the which part of it do we designate her or such. 
if our original intent was to talk about the river as the of Linz, um, that's one defines one set of scope uh, criteria. But again, this is what the committee has to get together and decide what it wants to do. I'm going to make a. That, oh. oh, sorry, sorry John, go ahead. If it's, if it's going to be pursued through an official plan amendment, it would have to remain within the Lindsay boundary. That's all. Okay. Emily? Um, what I was going to say is I think what might be the best first steps for the subcommittee is to do two things. One is to actually think about your goals. So what you actually want this recognition through whatever means it ends up doing what you actually want it to achieve. Like, do you want to achieve design guidelines? Do you want to have general protection as a cultural heritage landscape? So what do you want? I think that that is uh, one thing that you have to do. Um, and then also to do the background research. So what's the actual importance of the river? What's its historical development? So do that kind of, you know, looking things up and writing it down. Um, I mean, I think we all know anecdotally what the significance of the river is, but it has to be, you know, on paper with words instead of verbally. Um, right. That would be my suggestion anyways. Well, we certainly probably have good guidance from our uh, writer of these things as to how we should go about it. And that would be you, I presume. Yes, but you need to do the research on this one because yeah. it's a committee project. Yeah. So I think what we should at this point do is uh, set up a first meeting for the subcommittee and we can do that either in this meeting or outside of this meeting. What is your preference? It doesn't matter to me. I mean, if people want to hash it a date right now, go ahead. Um, I think Jim is missing, but you can tell him when it is. I think he's best available on Mondays and Tuesdays. So there you go. That's I my like knowledge of Jim's schedule. I like the idea of doing it. Um, later this month, Mondays or Tuesdays, uh, or perhaps into early October. I think the sooner we, we get together, the better. I would say if we could do it in September, it gives us a chance to meet again as we are still a committee so that we have something to give as guidance for the new committee, whoever that may be. So I would be in favor of doing it in September. So that gives us the following Mondays, the 12th, the 19th, or the 26th. So I'm not available on the 12th, but I'm available on the 19th or the 26th, if that does any good. I just, I have to tell you, I. I am not available after 4.30 p.m. on Mondays. So I don't know what time you're thinking of having this. I think we could accommodate it in the afternoon. Okay. All right, is that okay with you, John? I know that you have work as, if we had it during the daytime. I, yeah, I'm good on the 19th or 26th, anytime afternoon, that's, I can make it work. Okay, could we uh, put the meeting for the 26th of September and a uh, place to be decided? And then I'll let you know what place I can find. <laughs> Is that acceptable to everybody on the subcommittee? And I'll talk to Jim about it as well. So at two o'clock in the afternoon on the 26th, for those people on the subcommittee, does that work? All right, I'm getting nods. So I'm going to propose that the first meeting be on the 26th at 2 p.m.
Does that work for you, Emily? Um, yeah, sure, I can make it work. I'm sure it'll be fine. All right. So can I have someone uh, move the acceptance of this um, discussion or, imp or information? Seconder. Julia, all those in favor? Thank you, motion is carried. And so now, Laura, I guess we're back to you, my dear. So we have a curatorial services presentation by Laura Love, our city curator. Hi, everyone. So nice to see all of you. I'm gonna see, I have a very, very short five slide um, sort of introduction to, to curatorial services. I met with most everyone online right now when I first, very first, um, began my, my employment with the city of Cortha Lakes. And this is um, sort of an update, but also for those of you who I didn't meet, um, curatorial services in a very short five slide, very quick presentation. So I'm going to share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Maybe the beginning. Yes, we can see it. Great. All right. So just again, brief introduction to myself, uh, Laura Love. I'm the newest member of economic development um, with the city of Cortha Lakes, uh, leading the curatorial services management uh, program. So um, very, in a nutshell, I suppose, um, curatorial services um, is in two parts. So first being the care and management of the artifact collection that is owned by the city of Kortha Lakes. And the other part is supporting and uplifting um, the heritage sector within the boundaries of the city of Kortha Lakes. So that's nine to 12 historical museums, um, archives and historical societies. Within curatorial services, um, my artifact or my this the council artifact policy just passed in June, um, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. So um, that is the care and management of the artifact collection. Those are the principles that guide my work. Um, the curatorial services. We will be exploring and hopefully expanding on artifact disaster and emergency planning. Um, what do we do when a disaster happens with our artifact collections? Uh, fire, flood, remediation, uh, insurance, what happens if? Fingers crossed it never happens, but um, I used to work, I was just in BC, and I think a, a few museums and historical societies says, they said it wouldn't happen here. And unfortunately, um, BC has lost quite a few of their artifact collections to, uh, to environment disasters. Uh, heritage sector and support and partnership. So we're, we're talking about repatriation and reconciliation. Again, the disaster and emergency planning, uh, policies, procedures, and collections care, what other museums and historical societies need to make sure that their collections care is the best that it can be, and um, professional development, training opportunities for them, just in case. Um, again, uh, the second portion of this position is community outreach, not just with the heritage sector, but with uh, the residents of the city as well, residents and visitors, so workshops. Um, Mentorship programs, hopefully partnering going forward with the different colleges across, not just within the city of Fourth Lakes, but across Ontario. Um, great uh, marketing, joint marketing and advertising for the local heritage sector and where the museum and historical or heritage sector is going forward. A big thing that we've been seeing across the sector, especially right now, is what museums and historical societies, the heritage sector can do when it comes to green initiatives, our environment, um, climate change, what can we do to um, to really help those 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 sectors? Um, uh, my work is guided um, very much through the Court Lakes Culture Vision Statement of 2030, um, and that is how and where my artifact policy flows out of. So the policy that was passed in June um, established the principles that outline the parameters that the City of Court Lakes collects from collects for. Um, so we would be the, the official repository for 3D objects within the city, and we followed those provincial and national guidelines to, to do so. 
within the policy there it outlines the mission and mandate the mandate and mission very much also guides the work that I do every day when it comes to collections care and management. So the city of Corth Lakes is very much committed to collecting, preserving and making publicly accessible those tangible objects, 3D artifacts that are considered to be significant to and representative of the human and natural history of the Corth Lakes region from first settlement to present day. Super quick, the, um, so from first settlement, the city of Corth Lakes does not collect um, items of indigenous origin and we collect up to 2022 and, and forward. So artifact policy at the top guides my work. And then we have our, the management directives that guides the artifact policy. Um, artifact acquisitions, how the city collects. Artifact deaccessions, how the city might choose very rarely to remove an item from the permanent collection. How the city um, goes through incoming and outgoing loans for traveling exhibits or exhibits. And um, those, um, again, then relate to a care and preservation management directive, how I care for through uh, provincial and national standards, the artifact collection, access to the collections, how people can access the city of Quarter Lakes, the corporate collections, and um, how and hopefully when we exhibit and display those items, how that, how that happens. And all of that, that how also is very much in much more detail in the collections management procedural manual, manual. So that follows the Ontario Heritage Act. It also goes through uh, the CRA, what I can and cannot do with deaccessioned items. That's very, very clear. So I do have some legislation that, that guides that work. And what I've been doing so far, right now I'm still very much in inventory mode. I've been to most, um, there, are, there are many uh, municipal facilities. I've been to I'll say eight fire stations of the many and I've been through most of the community halls so far which is wonderful and we are I am still building the inventory um, that the that the city owns and cares for so besides writing policies and looking at grants I am also inventorying at the moment and going forward we're also in the middle of hopefully looking at software as well so once that inventory is robust and complete, what, what do we do with that, with that information? One day, hopefully, of course, purchasing software takes, takes a minute. Putting all of that data in the software takes a minute. And what happens with the data? So hopefully in the not so distant future, it will be all accessible online um, to residents and to visitors. That's me in a very quick little nutshell. Sounds like a rather large nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really lovely little nutshell. All right, do we have any questions or comments for Laura? I should also clarify that the artifact policy and the work I do, it just pertains to the artifact collection owned by the city of Corth Lakes. I have no jurisdiction in any private collections, any private museums or historical societies, this is just for the city collection. Any and, comments or questions? Bill Peel, are you uh, asking? Laura, would, would Settlers okay. Village and Bob Cajun be included in uh, the area that you'd be responsible for? Good question. Um, Settlers Village is a separate museum, so it's um, it's beyond the jurisdiction that I have. So they they collect privately with Court the Settlers Village. Um, so I have no. If they are looking for support, if they're looking for grant support, or if they need advice or uh, really advice for collections care, um, grant writing, procedures, policies, you name it, I can help them. Um, but this is just a for the care and management of the collection is just for the city. The city doesn't own the collection at Kortha Lakes or Kortha Settlers Village. Thank you. I had a question now. Ron? Yeah, sorry, my camera's cutting in and out. That's what it is, so sorry about that. Um, just a question there, Laura, on, on, I'm not sure if you look after it, but each former township and village and town had their own records. Do you? 
are you archiving them or are you like, for example, Emily Township, Omimi, Balkage and Verlum? Uh, you know, there were several or like 17 different municipalities prior to amalgamation. Are, are we keeping track or keeping an inventory of those records still? And are they retrievable? Like they go back a long time, obviously. But, Absolutely, um, great question. Excuse me. Um, when you and just to clarify, when you say uh, records, are you referring to um, like paper records? Or? Well, like well, like council records and things like that, like um, so surveys, reports, maps, oh. and things like that, maps and that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, uh, Angela Fornelli with records, she documents and take care takes care of those records um, as they pertain to the city of Port Lakes and the history within the townships and the villages and, and things that were amalgamated in 2001. So paper documents um, are under records or archives and she would be and happily proudly documents that history. Okay, thanks. So you are, if I can paraphrase this all, you are for three projects and the ARC is responsible for the FM. Yes, um, Angela and I like to say that I care for the 3D objects, she cares for the 2D objects. So I have the things that you can hold, well, yeah, hold, touch, smell. She has items that are obviously primarily flat. So postcards, photographs, um, uh, maybe some calendars, depending. Um, and she has those, um, Councillor Ashmore, the the documents of council or um, maps. Those those items and is they're under her care. So, any other questions? There being none. I would like to thank you for your presentation today, Laura. Absolutely. And I would ask for a mover to have this received as information for the committee. Anne and Ian. I'd love all to stay on. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. All those in favor? Thank you. I'd and love to stay on. I do have to pop off. I'm heading to New Brunswick in the wee hours. Um, so thank you so much for everything. It was so nice to see all of you and I look forward to seeing you all um, in a couple of weeks. Have a wonderful safe trip. Thank you so much. Bye everyone. Have a great long weekend. All right. So we move on to the subcommittee updates portion of our meeting. The designated property subcommittee, um, would you like to do this one, Emily? Sure, um, there's not much to report on this one. Um, I sent around the list of, um, of city owned properties to everybody to have a look at, um, to figure out a list of which ones need to go on the inside. So I've got that in my email. So I'll reach out to everybody and we'll chat about when we can go in and do that. Uh, and then we'll reach out to building and property and set that up. Okay, thank you. Any comments or questions? <clears throat> I think we have to decide yet whether we're doing this uh, um, research as individuals or in teams or whether the whole committee is going to go around and to have a meeting, Emily, when, when we that. Sure. Yeah, we'll set something up and then people can decide how they want to do it. If everyone wants to traipse around together or if you want to divide and conquer, I don't care how you do it, but um, just the committee, the subcommittee can figure it out and tell me. <laughs> And then I'll set, um, I'll set it up with building and property. Okay, so um, will I leave it to you, Emily, to cause that meeting to happen or should one of us cause it? I'll send around an email and we'll set something up. All right. May I have someone move the acceptance of this report? Skip, thank you. Seconded by? John? All those in favor? That motion is carried. The door is open, subcommittee Ian. Thank you, Arthur. Um, 
if any of you happens to be listening to the local radio station this morning, shortly after nine o'clock, uh, there was a little promotion of Outdoors Open on there and the uh, radio presenter ran through the entire list of sites, which was nice to hear. There are 11 sites on the roster this year and uh, I will go through them. Emily, you may need to interject and correct me if I forget any of them. So the Kirkfield and District Historical Society Museum is one of them. Um, Maryboro Lodge, I think, is another, although I don't believe you can go inside at that point. Um, Cherry Tree Lodge, the cottage down at Sturgeon Point, the Sturgeon Point Union Church, um, St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Lindsay, St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church also in Lindsay, the um, Old Jail Museum, Corthel Lakes Museum and Archives also in Lindsay, the Bethany Post Office, the old blacksmith shop in Argyle, um, now the antique store over there, that's, that's nine. Um, what are we missing, Emily? You're muted. Sorry, um, Maryborough Lodge is not on because it's under What's construction. Not? Yeah. So, uh, hold on, I will, I'm just pulling it up on the door, <laughs> our list here. Okay, so we have the Boyd Museum, Cherry that's Tree Lodge. Not. Kawartha Lakes Museum and Archives, formerly known as the Old Jail, the Kirkfield Museum, the Argyle Antique Store, Bethany Post Office, the Old Fenland Hospital, um, the St. Andrews in Lindsay, St. Mary's in Lindsay, Sturgeon Point Union Church, and Williams Design Studio. Yeah, so there's a good mixture of sites. Um, many of them, uh, especially the museums, are examples of sites of, that were Heritage buildings that have been repurposed for additional uses, so well, that obviously applies to things like Williams Design Studio and the, uh, the old Penwood Hospital. Um, the churches were chosen either in the case of Sturgeon Point Union Church because of their unique design, or in the case of St. Andrews because it was designed by a well-known local architect. And St. Mary's um, five years ago underwent a very extensive renovation, so that was the primary reason for it being uh, recommended. So that's really about it. Uh, the sites will be open from 10 to 4, except for a couple of the churches, which will be 12 to 4. Some of the sites will have um, different activities that you can you can do with them or sort of value-added features. There'll be some music at St. Andrews and Lindsay. And uh, we are encouraging all volunteers who are um, stationed at each site to keep uh, keep a record of how many people attend so that we can feed that information up to the Ontario Heritage Trust. Um, it's all free. We hope to see many of you out on the 11th. Is there anything else to add, Emily? Yeah, the driving tours. So we also yes. have three driving tours, which you can do on Sunday. Um, I'm there not quite up online yet because I meant to do that today, but it, <laughs> they're not there. So I'll get those up tomorrow. Um, so they're the same routes as last year, just a little bit different in terms of the sites that are there, but they're just going to stay up online, um, sort of in perpetuity. Uh, there's brochures that you can print off for those, and we're also going to print off some paper brochures that people can pick up at the service centers for those. Um, so there's the, the Fenland Bob, to Bob Cajun one, there's the Lindsay down to Pontypool one, and then there is the Oakwood to Kirkfield one. So they're just sort of self-serve driving tours. Um, most of the places are just ones you drive by and look at. Um, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Go to Doors Open. Um, yeah, and the other thing is, I, as I mentioned before, the Manvers Historical Society is doing their little plaque unveiling at 10. Mm -hmm. So come to Bethany and then disperse. All right, thank you uh, both for that report. Is anyone any questions or comments? I've actually seen more advertising around for doors open uh, this year have for many years. And uh, so I, I hope to focus within our local communities because it's a wonderful thing to be able to go inside some of the places that only look at from the outside. I'm being told that can I now unstable so if i disappear please realize i'm not mad at you and i didn't leave on purpose <laughs> so um any questions or comments 
Well, I'd like to thank the committee for their work because having done this before myself, it's a lot of work. So thank you. All right, may I have someone move the acceptance of this report? Bill Peel, seconded by Sandy. All those in favor? The motion is carried. Um, the next is the Pickerel Point cabins, and I turn that over to you, Councillor Ashmore. Thanks, Ethel. Um, basically, it's the same update as the last month or the last time I spoke about it. Um, I was in. I have a dedicated person from Trent Severn Waterway. I'm working with Karen Freely, and um, as she said, they're not going to do anything in, unless we have, um, unless we. Um, or in other words, to give them time to uh, prove that there were some ownership of, the, of those structures. So in other words, they're not gonna be doing any demolition, which is good. We're, but right now we're in election mode and we can't instruct staff to do searches and things like that. So Realty and, and the city solicitor can't, can't do these things, unfortunately. I'd like to, but I can't be asking. I, I, they've been working on it before, but it's gonna, it's gonna to have to go into the new council here, but at least we've got the assurance that nothing's gonna to be torn down. So we've got some, a bit of time left to research some of the prior ownership of these cabins, if there, if there ever was owners, if they've been going back quite a few years, but you know, worth a try. So we're still at it. That's about all I can give you an update right now. So no, no demolitions. All right, any questions or comments relating to this report? Anne. Ron, I'm just wondering, when would you have talked to Karen last? Like how, did she give you an idea of how long they're gonna let you, or whoever? Yeah, I think it was mid-July I talked to her. Okay. So, um, it wasn't too long ago. She seemed like, she didn't give me a deadline. She seemed quite flexible. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, so there wasn't a, like a drop dead deadline that I had to get. The city had to supply them with information, so it sounded like they were they were still work, willing to work with us, so, which was positive. Yeah. I'll keep in touch with her too. Anyone else? Any other questions or comments? All right, I know I discussed with Ron when would be the best time for us to try and get a look at these places. And I think the winter is the best time going across the ice. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, so I would suggest that uh, we postpone any site visit until the winter and the ice is in. All right, may I have someone move the acceptance of this report? Ian, thank you. And a seconder, please. Skip. All those in favor? That motion is carried. And then we have the Heritage Con District sub. Emily? Uh, we're meeting next Tuesday. That's, <laughs> that's the update. Um, so that'll be starting to talk about the HCD plan and then going into the public meetings on the 15th and the 20th. That is it. Okay, thank you. Any questions, comments? All right, may I have a mover to accept this for information? Skip and then Julia. All those in favor? Thank you, the motion is carried. Do we have any correspondence, Emily? Nope, nothing, nobody likes us. Well, nobody hates us either. That's also. Awesome. <laughs> um, any new or other business that someone wishes to bring up? Ron. Thank you, I just wanna mention on the 21st, uh, of uh, August, um, I was at the unveiling of the of the nice plaque that we gave the Pleasant Point Union Church, and we dedicated that plaque. Actually, Mike Slavota, former member, was with me there, 
and we dedicated that plaque to the uh, to the church for their hundredth anniversary. So it was it was great. There was just there was a lot of people there, and they were really happy with what the heritage committee did uh, by having this plaque uh, made and presented to the uh, to the church. So it meant it meant a lot to them, and they were quite quite impressed with it, and they. They thanked me, and so I wanted to let the committee know that they were quite grateful of uh, of that plaque. Looks really nice if you ever down that way. It meant a lot to them, so it was a good day. My only comment would be that when we do things like that, it might be interesting for the committee to know about it, so more members could actually go and support you. That's true, yeah. We should maybe get the word out a bit more, but um, next time we do a, an unveiling, we'll, we'll do that. Was your hand up, Anne? No? <laughs> yeah, yes, it was. I, okay. I just wanted to say um, the heritage inventory that we started in Bob Cajun, um, I haven't talked to anybody else yet who's doing it in Bob Cajun. We've had some pretty wet weather, but we have been getting out, Emily. Um, and it's actually really fun. So if anybody else is thinking of helping, um, we had homeowners come out and tell us about their homes and yeah, it, it was fun. It, it's going to take a lot more work than I thought because you do get waylaid talking to people, but it's fun. Thank you. Yes, if anybody no. wants to wander around Bob Cage and we still have some areas that have yet to be assigned. And by yet to be assigned, I mean, they're assigned to me right now. So if you want to do it, then um, tell me. Okay, Beth and I had a lot to do this summer. So we decided we were going to start in September. And I do understand we have until Thanksgiving to complete our areas. Is that correct, Emily? Yeah, if you can get it done by Thanksgiving, that's great. If it's the end of October, you know, who cares, right? But we'll we'll try and get try and get it done by Thanksgiving. And then if you're late, then it's not too late in the year and before the weather gets bad. Okay, thank you. Anne? Um, it would be helpful to know who's doing what areas because if we're bounding an area that's you, Emily, and we've got extra time on a day and you haven't done part of it, like we could help. Sure. Yeah, I'll I'll send around a list of who's doing what. Okay, thanks. Well, thinking it might be nice to map up the town block the sections of who's where, and then you're relating either side of you rather than just the names of streets. Sure. Yeah, I can do that. I'll just pull together a little Google map and put some rectangles on it. Um, so just kind of as so everybody knows everything, the islands, and south, um, the islands are sorted. Um, the Rokeby town site is partially sorted. There's a bit of it that I'm doing and I'm doing everything um, west of, sorry, east of 36, but that's easy. Uh, and then there's um, some, like the, sort of the, I'm doing the ring around the outside by myself. Um, that's an easier one to do, but then there's some stuff, uh, sort of that head street, uh, Joseph street, that kind of area, front street west. That's the area that we don't have anybody for at the moment. Uh, so if you if you want to walk around Bob Cajun, um, but yes, I will send out a, a map for everybody. Thank you. All right. May I? Um, do we need to have for information, Emily, or for other, so? All right. Next meeting, which we've already discussed, is going to be in November. Yep, November 3rd. And we don't know if that will be in person or on Zoom again at this point. That's right. It all depends on City Hall and construction and blah, 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 and who's doing what, when, where, and if we can have a room. So um, we'll see. I will let everybody know. Okay. Will there be an option to zoom in, even if it's in a, a meeting room? Yeah. So when we do go back to in-person meetings, I will do it like we did in 2021 when we had a few in-person meetings. So we'll have... Um, 
whoever wants to be in person can be in person. I'll be in person. Um, any other staff and committee members who want to zoom in will be on Zoom. And then any members of the public, you know, if somebody's doing a, a deputation or something, they'll be on Zoom too. Okay, just to, to make it easy. Thank you. May I have someone make a motion to adjourn? And I have a second. Bill, thank you all very much for attending. It's been really great to see you again. And apart from the subcommittee members, I'll see you all again in November. <laughs>